Hi, everybody. In this episode of Trek in Time, we're going to talk about how the writers simply couldn't resist this storyline. <laughs> That's right. We're talking about Enterprise, episode 23 of season two, Regeneration. This episode originally dropped on May 7th, 2003. Welcome, everybody, to Trek in Time, where by now you should know we're taking a look at all of Star Trek in chronological order, and we're taking a look at how the world was at the time of the original broadcast. That means right now, it's still early days, we're still in Enterprise, but we're right at the edge of the end of season two. Matt, can you believe it? I cannot believe it. I can't wait for season three. (laughs) Yeah, cannot wait for season three. Looking forward to it. But right now, we're at the end of season two, so we're still looking at what was going on in the world in mid-2003. This episode was on May 7th, 2003, so we're going to be talking about that. And who is the we doing this talking? Well, it's me. I'm Sean Farrell. Blah, blah, blah. I'm a writer. Blah, blah. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And with me is my brother, Matt. Matt is the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel, Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. Matt, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. How about yourself? I'm doing okay except for the fact i got a little tongue-tied there as i was trying to say youtube it's a lot harder to say that than it sounds as usual we like to start off our episodes with a little bit of commentary from the listeners and matt do you have some comments that you want to share with us today i do uh from cogenitor which was the last episode we talked about uh there was a comment from robotrab saying another great show guys you touched on a point that has always kind of bugged me too No one in Starfleet seems to get in trouble for their crimes. Officers have committed mutiny, disobeyed orders, stolen. Who even knows how much shuttlecraft, lied, cheated, even poisoned entire planets with no repercussions. About the only things a Starfleet officer gets in trouble for is joining the Maquis or going back in time. And that was my big complaint. No ramifications. Uh, Tied to that was a comment from Deet Co., Uh, While I agree with Sean that the morality play is strong and stands on its own, I'm actually more in mind with Matt on this one. I consider the internal the internal show ship with its crew as a consistent existing presence in this universe. If Trip doesn't suffer any actual consequence, why should we? Why should he ever think about his own actions and how they'll reflect on his captain, crew, species? And he goes on about that. So it's like once again another comment about. The lack of ramifications is a bit of a problem. Yeah. And then there was a comment from Eboss. This could have easily been a Mayweather episode with him being the explorer for ones. The cogenitor character had little depth written into it to anthropomorphize it in this way. Uh, Trim's empathy is too quick and feels forced. It's just like you guys say, there is a delicate story here, but the shortcuts the episode takes kind of undermine it. Hmm. Very good comments. I I agree with the vision of it's important for there to be consistency with the episodes. I completely agree with that. That's one of the big things that we're going to be talking about um, as an ongoing presence in this podcast. We're yeah. one of the big things that we're both going to be talking about are consistency within the shows from episode to episode. And for me, if something is not consistent, I think that it can be balanced a bit if just the strength of the writing is good enough so it's it's right i think that's the balancing act that we were talking about last time so i appreciate those comments those are really really uh good for context in not only the episode but what we're trying to do with this podcast so yep thanks to everybody for weighing in and oh what's that noise oh matt it's a read alert That can only mean one thing. It's time for you to get into the Wikipedia description. Unfortunately for you, it's a long one again this time. So (laughs) best of luck. We're talking about regeneration, people. That can only mean one thing. Get ready for some Borg. (laughs) Regeneration is the 49th episode of the American science fiction television series Star Trek Enterprise, the 23rd episode of the second season. It first aired on May 7th, 2003 on the UPN network in the United States. Okay, we already established that being an American science. Okay, all right. Yeah. The episode was written by Mike Sussman and Phyllis Strong and was directed by David Livingston. It was a follow-up to the feature film Star Trek First Contact. (laughs) 
<laughs> was it? <laughs> Set in the 22nd century, the series follows the adventures of the first Starfleet Starship Enterprise registration NX-01. In this episode, <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep going. You're going to have to take a like, deep breath. Take a deep it breath. It feels like copy paste from so many of these descriptions. In this episode, a research team in the <laughs> Arctic inadvertently triggers the reanimation of several cybernetically enhanced aliens killed in an apparent spacecraft crash over 100 years earlier. The aliens assimilate the researchers before escaping into space. The Enterprise pursues the ship and is attacked, forcing Archer to destroy the vessel. Afterwards, they discover that the aliens sent a message into the Delta Quadrant containing the coordinates of Earth, a message that will not arrive until the 24th century. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the crazy thing about one of the crazy things I think about the synopsis in particular in this podcast in general is our regular listeners will remember that there are episodes, especially at the beginning of the podcast, and I'm very hesitant to go back and listen to them because mm -hmm. I'm terrified of what I would hear. We used to get lost in the murky, murky weeds of plot points and getting like literally scene by scene and talking about these things. And that was largely my fault because I didn't know what I was doing in the early days. I still don't know what I'm doing, but I'm having more fun. Hooray. <laughs> so the thing about this synopsis is by the end of the synopsis, it actually does a really good job of synopsizing the episode. It has yes. that first paragraph, which is completely pointless and reminds you multiple times. It's an American television program. Thank you for that reminder. But the synopsis isn't half bad. And it makes me recognize that what we need to be doing is figuring out if the synopsis doesn't actually synopsize the episode as nicely as this, we need to synopsize the episodes as nicely as this so yes. well done synopsis you did a half ass job and that half was pretty good so <laughs> that brings me around to talking about the particulars of the episode as it was mentioned this was by sussman and strong we've seen their writing before they are very familiar names for enterprise and it was directed by david livingston he is this season in season two he's directed two other episodes and he's one of the more competent directors on the show and I think that that shows in this episode as well. The original air date was May 7th, 2003, and guest appearances included Admiral Forrest was back in, played by Vaughn Armstrong, as usual. There is Jim Fitzpatrick as Commander Williams, Chris Wayne as Dr. Monger, Benita Frendrency as Rooney, John Short as Drake, and Paul Scott as Lieutenant Foster. Most of these people appear... The, the trio of researchers appear at the front end of the episode and are very quickly dismissed mm -hmm. as characters in the episode when we finally rejoin this action as it takes place on the ship when they go to Enterprise. As I mentioned, the air date was May 7th, 2003. So in a strange bit of coincidence, like we're kind of in time with that. So mm -hmm. kind of a strange meshing. And if we had actually recorded this episode when we had originally intended to record it, we would have been recording it on or about the seventh. So very That's strange. Weird. Yeah. And what was the world like when this episode aired? Well, Matt, you'll remember you were dancing your little heart out to when I'm gone by three doors down a song that if you asked me to sing it with the threat of death, I would be a dead man. <laughs> And the movie theaters, well, Matt, you were lining up for X2, and you're saying, X2? What the heck is that? Well, we'll all remember that X2, also marketed as X-Men United, and internationally as X-Men 2, because I guess internationally they decided not to be s silly about what they named it. It's the 2003 superhero film directed by Brian Singer, and it was the revisiting all the X-Men characters that had been introduced in the first X-Men film. As everybody knows, I'm sure this would include Patrick Stewart, Hugh Jackman, Ian McKellen, Haley Berry, Famke Jensen, James Marsden, yada, 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 a thousand different people. Yep. And all in all, it's a pretty good film. It made $85 million in its opening week. And on television, what were we watching? Well, Matt, you and I were watching Enterprise as well. <laughs> right along with us were 4 million other viewers. So a pretty steady pace for Enterprise at this point. But it was by no means leading the chase. It was up against shows like My Wife and Kids and George Lopez, which were getting about 9 million viewers. That's right. The primetime edition of Star Search, that show that Matthew and I do not believe actually happened, 
It was also getting 9 million viewers. That 70s show and American Idol were getting 11 and 22 million viewers, respectively, on Fox. Dateline was pulling in 9 million on NBC. And Dawson's Creek, well, once again, we find out that Dawson's Creek has the, what it takes to beat up Enterprise. They mm-hmm. had almost 5 million viewers. So Star Trek Enterprise was in last place for the week. The big winner for the week, though, was CSI, which had 25 million viewers on CBS. And in the news, the New York Times, here we go once again with looking back at old news, which is strange in its alignment with today's news. On May 7th, 2003, the New York Times included articles such as this one, The SARS Epidemic Frontline Research by Lawrence Altman. The death rate from SARS may be significantly higher than health officials had thought, up to 55% in people 60 and older and up to 13.2% in younger people. The first major epidemiological study of the disease suggests. <laughs> Mortality rates are bound to change somewhat as an epidemic continues, but unless the numbers fall drastically, SARS could be among, inf- be among infectious diseases with the highest death rates. Until now, fatality rates reported by the World Health Organization had ranged from 2% when the epidemic first detected in March to 7.2%. So here we were, in 2003, talking about this little known disease family called SARS, which could potentially have a larger impact. And it's good to know that we were paying attention and we prepared accordingly. We were prepared for a pandemic. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So we'll leave the news and the TV shows and the movies behind and we'll jump into the 22nd century on March 1st. 2153, when a team of researchers goes to the Arctic Circle. Now, Matt, I am going to jump into a couple of questions for you because, based <laughs> on your reading of the synopsis, I wonder if something was lost on you. What did you, you pick up on the fact that this was a continuation of First Contact? No, I did not. See, that's. One of my major complaints about this episode. We start with a story that's in the Arctic Circle with characters we do not know. and Which is a problem I've complained about before. <laughs> end up, yeah, we end up with what looks very much like an homage to John Carpenter's The Thing. That was my first note I wrote myself was yes. The Thing, the exclamation thing. mark. <laughs> so in the first few minutes of this episode, I am left with, well... I know what they are seeing and they do not. And these are not characters I care about. Mm -hmm. So I right out of the gate was in the midst of this ain't good because these are not characters we care about. This is not like we're seeing trip and Archer on an ice planet, finding a bunch of Borg and starting to thaw them out and not knowing Mm -hmm. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. This is complete strangers doing something that we as the audience members no is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. It struck me that you don't want your audience knowing everything ahead of your protagonists because you suck every bit of tension out of the proverbial room. And in this case, it was the, the Arctic tents that they were using. I found all the sort of future arctic exploration sci tech babble fine i found like their equipment their ship that they had brought with them to do all this stuff the fact that they were there not as part of starfleet but in conjunction with starfleet fine I, all of that was it was literally just well this is fine but it really made me think they were starting the episode in the wrong place what did you think i completely agree it was the, the, I can't remember how long the opening was. It felt like it went on forever. And it was like, this has no relation to anything with the enterprise at all. And it was nothing new because once again, they're using something that we're so familiar with as Star Trek fans. It was like, ah, oh, it's Borg. All these people are going to die. They're going to become Borg. And then bad stuff is going to happen because Borg, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was just, it, there was, there was really nothing to it. So for me, there was no tension. There was no interest. It didn't hook me. And the fact that it felt like the movie, the thing to me, I also wrote a note to myself saying in general, in the episode, I kind of like this, but it feels a little like fan fiction. Mm -hmm. Like 
what if Star Trek met the thing? And it was yeah. like, <laughs> it, it didn't, nothing was really clicking, but there were elements of the episode that I did like, but in general, I thought it was kind of a, a just, it was off just because yeah. of the way they set it up. Yeah. It made me feel like I was of two minds at once. It made me feel a little bit out of my own head because I found myself thinking, well, I either want more of this thing, homage, the thing homage. I want this all mm-hmm. to be what it was, a bunch yes. of scientists on the planet doing this and make it literally just a bottle episode. If you're going to yes. be that bold as to tell a story about humans in the 22nd century interacting with the Borg, be that bold to do that. Leave the Enterprise out of it and just make it about some set of humans scrambling to survive against them and literally make a fan fiction episode or you got to lop it off and you've Mm got to just jump to could this episode have worked and i'm asking you this legitimately do you think this episode could have worked if it had started with the enterprise getting communication from earth saying something weird just happened in the arctic circle a team of researchers went missing and we think we tracked their ship leaving the system and heading toward you can you intercept do you think that that as a beginning, as an opening tease, could have worked better than what was in the show? It would have. But at the same time, as soon as you start to give any kind of hint as to what's going on, because this is a villain from the series that is so well known, it would immediately be popping that balloon attention. Yeah. Like there's no way around it. And for me, the other side of it is this is the problem when you mess with time. <laughs> the yeah. kind of show we know we know what happens with the borg we know before the show has even aired its first episode what happens to the borg yeah so the fact that they're using this as a oh tension borg what's going to happen it's like yeah we know nothing's going to happen because every show that came after this in the timeline exists has dealt with the borg yeah. and has existed which to jump to the end of this episode, that whole from the description where it's like the the signal was sent to the Delta Quadrant and it's going to be the 24th century, blah, blah, blah. My first thought was, and I wrote this down of this completely undercuts the next generation setup of the Borg. Yes. Because Q is the one that introduces humanity to the Borg. He throws right. the Enterprise into the Delta Quadrant. They meet the Borg. I remember Guinan saying something like they're not supposed to meet them yet. And mm-hmm. everything goes back and it's like, okay, now the Borg knows humanity exists and they're coming for you. And this tries to set it up as if this is what did it. And it's like, right. no, you can't have your cake and eat it too here. This is completely bizarre and stupid. Can I put my little why- writer hat on for a moment, moment and have my cake yeah. and eat it too? Oh boy. Without going too hip deep into the series Picard, one of the things that Trek is now toying with are things about motivations of Q. Yep. And you could take the tack of saying if the enterprise had not been thrown as far as they were to actually meet the Borg, the Borg conceivably could have shown up at earth totally unexpected. And because of how they operated immediately been able to subjugate earth. Q may have shown up and done it in a mustache twirling way, but he may have known, well, that signal just got to the Borg. The Borg now know about Earth, so I'm going to make sure that Earth knows about the Borg and throws the Enterprise out to meet them. That is... Okay, so, okay, that's a very cool interpretation, but the problem is that's not in the text of absolutely. any of the movies, absolutely. any of the shows. It's not, it's not right. in the text. I absolutely text. get it. And I, again, not to go too spoilery or too deep into shows that we're not talking about yet. Uh, we'll be talking about Picard probably in 15 years. So stay tuned, everybody, <laughs> to hear our thoughts about Picard. Although or the After we, Dark. <laughs> or we will be talking about it in our subscriber-only podcast, which we will be releasing to subscribers very soon. You may see it in your inbox shortly after this episode drops, and we will, in fact, be talking about Picard there. But without going too deep and too spoilery into that, there were actors involved in Picard who revealed 
after being in it that they were pleased with certain events in the series because it matched the headcanon that they had created for themselves. So this is from an actor within the show saying, I had an idea of what my character would have done. And I was so pleased to see that in Picard, they gave me the chance to do that and make it legitimate canon instead of it just being my idea about what would happen. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree with you. There's nothing to make what I just suggested real within the canon of the series. I think this episode does that again and again and again in a way that undermines the value of this episode. Mm -hmm. And just to cut through into two different aspects of this episode that stood up, one is about what I just said directly. This episode was intended to be a follow on to first contact the spheroid ship that the Borg release in first contact that goes back in time to the era of Zephram Cochran. That's the remains of the ship that are crashed at the North pole. That's the ship they're finding. Mm -hmm. And in the episode, Archer has a flashback to remembering every speech he's read by Zephram Cochran, everything Zephram Cochran ever said or wrote down. And he remembers the weird Princeton graduation speech that Zephyrin Cochran gave in which he talked about cyborgs from the future. In First Contact, Zephyrin Cochran is beautifully depicted as being a drunk. So -hmm. the idea that within the end of his life, he was a hard drinking, sometimes loose lipped and had to backtrack and explain away. Basically, at the end of his life, he would have largely been leaning heavily on the idea of, well, I'm just a drunk, so ignore most of what I say. Mm -hmm. So kind of generating that that uh, reputation for himself in order to get out of the mistakes of having over revealed stuff about the Borg invasion of the past. So this episode was intended to directly be that connective tissue. It was unnecessary. And as you said, Matt, because it's teasing out an element of, well, that signal is going to take so long to get there. It will be the 24th century before it's ever picked up by the Borg homeworld. You're left with having to either say, well, ultimately, then this episode doesn't matter at all. Yep. Or you're left with having to come up with a creation like I did explaining, oh, So Q wasn't just being a jerk and saying, humanity, you're not ready to be out here. He was actually saying, humanity, you're not ready to be out here. I'm going to help you. Which then is a a turn to the Q character that, again, is not supported by anything in all the experiences we've seen of Q. So So can I say something about this? This brings up two problems I have. Well, not two problems. It's. Like I mentioned, I enjoyed the episode. There was aspects of it I enjoyed. Like yes. There was the cat and mouse game with the ship and how the crew was reacting to the fight. It was like, I was interested in that to see yeah. how Archer and the crew would, would handle it. Yeah. I never felt concerned that they were ever in actual danger. Right. So there was no threat, but I did enjoy aspects of seeing how their characters would react, which is why I keep saying it felt like fan fiction to me. Yeah. So it, it was meaningless. It was just like, oh, well, how would they react to this? But it, it does bring up the question of like, why uh, they why the creators of this series kept relying on villains from the star trek universe yeah the way they were especially the borg which are something that's from future series right it's like it's irritating when we keep bringing up of oh they keep relying on the klingons and they keep relying on x and they keep relying on y and it's like right. oh now they're bringing in the borg it's like oh are you are you joking right and i'm not going to give anything away but I've been watching the new Star Trek series, Strange New Worlds. Mm-hmm. And in a nutshell, I'm loving this show so far. And I watched episode two. Totally new, totally unique. But it's still in timeline of the whole series. And it's right. like exhilarating to see wonderful, exciting Star Trek new sci fi ideas yeah. being explored with characters you're starting to get to know and care about. And it's like, why couldn't have Enterprise been doing more of that? And which is why I keep saying, can we please fast forward to season three? Because it's like they actually start to do new and interesting yeah. things in season three of the show. 
it's so infuriating that the show keeps relying on the old, the old stuff, just yeah. bringing up, just drudging up old stuff again and again. Yeah, it really does speak of the the exhaustion on the the part of the makers that you and I have talked about in previous episodes. And to speak directly to the point of what is it that brought them to this, there was in my research a note I found about regeneration was intended to follow up on the events depicted in Star Trek First Contact. And Brandon Braga initially refused to feature the Borg inter- Enterprise, calling it, quote, a cheap trick. He was right. Go. He was right. Mm-hmm. However, he agreed to them appearing in regeneration when it was suge- suggested, saying that this was such a great concept, he couldn't resist it. I wish he had a little bit yes, more. Right. And one of the yeah. things that I think is uh, the kind of yardstick for how hard should he have resisted it, Voyager took place in the Delta Quadrant and did not lean heavily on the Borg. It had a Borg character, but it didn't over rely on the Borg as the threat constantly. And to show this as an element of enterprise really did feel like a cheap trick. It felt like, I guess you, Sean, could say resistance is futile. Yes, I could. I could resisted. say that. I was but not going to say that, but <laughs> there was also this element. And here's where I think they were able to resist. Writers Judith and Garfield Reeves Stevens pitched a story to be used for season five of Enterprise, which would have followed up on the events in Regeneration. They intended to bring actress Alice Krieg back to Star Trek as a Starfleet medical technician who makes contact with the Borg seen in regeneration. And then this would have turned Krieg, who played the Borg queen in first contact into the Borg queen. I'm so glad they didn't. I am so glad they didn't make that episode. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been, it would have been fan service that would have been both completely unnecessary and would have just been so lazy. It would have just Mm -hmm. been such a lazy fan fiction moment. A couple of details about the episode that don't stand out in any way, shape, or form. The Arctic explorers, the researchers, one of them is a woman. This was, in fact, Billingsley, Dr. Phlox, his wife. And when she auditioned for the part, everybody who knew that she was his wife stayed out of the room. So she went through the audition process and got cast in the show completely on her own on her own merits but i do love the fact that billingsley suggested more than once that she should play all of his wives in the show (laughs) i thought that was a a neat a neat little uh footnote to her being there ultimately the thing in this episode that stood out as for me the most interesting component was Flox's fighting of the infection yeah, of the nanites. There were certain lines of dialogue, especially in the beginning of the episode, that just stuck out as like, these are supposed to be 22nd century scientific researchers. And one of them looks at a microscope and says, I guess you could call them nanites. <laughs> it's like, yeah, <laughs> like, like <laughs> all right, let's not dumb down the dialogue too much for an audience in the 20th century. You could have just said, these are nanites. These yes. <laughs> look at these yes. nanites I found. These nanites are fixing these bodies. Why are these bodies dead? But they have nanites that are functioning. This is amazing. Instead, they're like, I, th- I guess you could call them nanites. <laughs> Flox gets infected by the nanites and he figures out effectively a cure. I found that storyline very moving. Watching the doctor prepare for and going through the tortured process of trying to do this work while also, as he says at the end, he was beginning to hear the voices. The voices yeah. He was yep. beginning to hear the conversation with the string of numbers. And the string of numbers would have eventually be revealed to be the star coordinates for Earth. So that his memory of that experience is the, the Borg collective. But as he is doing his research, he even prepares a kill switch. For himself mm-hmm. and the impact of that on archer the impact of sato's visit 
I thought was nicely rendered of her coming down with the food for the animals and she's going to take care of his menagerie of animals while he's struggling with this. And he warns her away, but she refuses to leave saying like, I, you've been there for me. I want to be here for you. And really at this point, the show has no, there's no doubt left that the crew is connected in this visceral way. And that's, Mm -hmm. it's really a very positive, um, set of scenes when the people that care about flocks are revealing their concern and yep. archers near refusal to say like, I, we're not going to kill you and flocks saying there's, there's no other option. And he's absolutely right. And within the context of the episode, I really liked all of that within the context of star Trek. It goes back yeah. to something you pointed out. Everything that happened here undermines the enterprise D's inability to recognize who these aliens are exactly because now it would be on record they would, they would have be on record they evidence. would have a would be cl- all the stuff they would have a solution okay we've got locutus put him in the chamber and blast him with omicron radiation and that will free picard from being a borg instead this- what we know is that data has to plug himself into the collective and communicate through picard to like this episode simultaneously does something very cool and something really bad yeah. it undermines it's fan, it's fan the entire series it's fan fiction yeah that's all it is so at the end we're left with a well-made fan film and yeah. i give them props for reusing old sets they pulled stuff out of mothballs that had been used most recently in voyager in order to borgify the enterprise I thought, as Matt mentioned, some of the tension out of how will they deal with this? I thought some of that was clever. I thought that mm-hmm. there were elements of the borgification of the Enterprise, Trip having to undo, as he called it, all this garbage, get this garbage out of here in order to bring the ship back to how it's supposed to be. That was interesting. And one aspect that I thought really stood out as this is something that is actually, from a filmmaking perspective, really cool that they did this. The first time that they encounter the aliens that have been captured by the Borg and they're still in the early stages of transition, we see them running through the Jeffrey's tubes of the Enterprise. Their hair is beginning to fall out. Their skin is beginning to change. The slow motion effect of becoming a Borg, I thought was well rendered. So all of that, I was just like, this is really well produced. They took time and effort and put it into this. And the shots of the Arctic crash site of the Borg ship. I even mm-hmm. thought this does what it's supposed to do. It's evocative of that Borg ship from first contact. It's showing the size of this vessel. And it's also providing you with the teaser. That's very thing like of it, something from another world was left here. It would have to go back to what you said in the very beginning. It might have, this episode might've actually worked better if it had no connection to the enterprise at all. It was just in the Antarctic. It really was just the thing. And it was a small group of these scientists that have this happen to them. And the last survivor destroys the entire facility to make sure that this does not escape. Right. And in destroying it, that explains why it's Earth not has a no record. Idea. We right. still haven't learned about it, but it happened. And it could be the Enterprise coming back to Earth and discovering like there was some kind of explosion in the Antarctic. We needed to go check it out. Right. And they go there and they, they look and find this smoldering crater. And they're like, right. what happened here? And they walk away. That would have been a better way to handle this. But again, I'm a big fan of, I, I care about these characters and I want to know about them and see their evolution. I do not want to see random character X that I will never see again. So it's right. like, I understand why they didn't go that direction, but it probably would have been a stronger episode. Yeah, absolutely agree. So listeners, let us know. Do you agree? Do you think this episode was well done but almost in spite of itself and well done but maybe it shouldn't have (laughs) let us know you can leave a comment in the comment section directly below this episode or you can find the contact information in the podcast description matt next time we're going to be talking about first flight you want to guess as to what we're talking about the wright brothers it's either gonna be the wright (laughs) brothers or archer makes a paper airplane (laughs) <laughs> but no spoilers we're gonna let you find out what that's about matt before we sign off is there anything we want to remind our listeners about 
uh, just to check out our other podcast, Still to be Determined, where Sean and I talk about uh, the kind of the ongoing conversation beyond my undecided uh, YouTube videos. As for me, I'd like to remind people, once again, we talked about it briefly in this episode. We are starting a subscribers-only podcast, a spinoff of this one. And subscribers, you will be getting it automatically in your inboxes. Keep an eye out for that. And if you want to support us, you can become a supporter by going to trekintime.show. Click the Become a Supporter button. It allows you to throw coins at our heads, and you will now start getting our secondary podcast in which we will be talking about newer Trek, Trek that we're, in, we're consuming right now, but without the concern about like, what was the world like? Well, look at your window, people. And <laughs> we'll also be talking about anything that crosses our paths, stuff that we find interesting. So it might be movies, might be TV shows, might be books, might be comics, who knows, but it's probably going to be in the vein of Marvel movies, Star Wars, Star Trek, you name it. Yep. So, Subscribers, I hope you enjoy that. All of that is coming your way. Don't forget to leave a review on Apple or Google or Spotify or wherever you found this podcast. You can subscribe and leave a review, share us with your friends. All of that really does help the channel. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And we'll talk to you next time.